Okay, well, hello everyone. And uh, it's quite a gathering from many different countries. So that's really great to see, at least the European Union here. So, um, okay, uh, we might just start with a, a guided meditation and then, well, you know the normal format. So we'll just start with uh, meditation. So just to begin with, um, just come back to the feeling of your body. Um, just resting your awareness right through your body. Feeling both your arms, both your legs, your head, your torso. Maybe feeling the weight of the body into the chair. And the pressure of the cushions against your back if you're leaning on something. And then just see if you can feel your whole body at once. Perhaps feeling the rhythm of your breathing moving through your body. And if any thoughts or feelings tug at your awareness, just gently disengage from them and tune again into the feeling of your body. Seeing if you can spread your awareness through your whole body together. Perhaps the way also being aware of your breath moving through it. And so now we'll just move through the body part by part and relax it. So just tuning into the sensations and the soles of your feet and in your toes. Just noticing any warmth or any tingling. or any pressure, any feelings you might sense there. And just, if there's any tension in your feet, just ask them to relax. And now, Sensing any sensations in the top of your feet. In your ankles.
Noticing any feelings in your cups. Emotions. And I'll see if you can be aware of the whole of your lower legs at once. And bringing your awareness into your knees. And to the crease behind your knees. And now feeling the sensations of your thighs. And if there's any tension there, just see if you can relax. And now, and just soak your awareness through the whole of your legs. No, feel any sensations in your abdomen. And your lower back. Bringing your awareness into your chest and your upper back. And now feeling the whole of your torso together. Now feeling the upper parts of your arms. And again, if there's any tension there, just letting it relax. Moving your attention to your elbows. 
and into your forearms. And then noticing any sensations in the palms of your hands. Perhaps you can feel some tingling there. Or some warmth. Or maybe cold if it's cold where you are. Now feeling the top of your hands. Now feeling the whole of your arms and hands together. Just see if you can soak your awareness through the whole of your arms and legs and torso. Feeling all of that at once. And now moving your awareness into your neck, to, or maybe first of all into your shoulders. And if there's any tension in your shoulders, see if you can let it relax. Maybe tightening those muscles and releasing them if you need to. And then moving your awareness into your neck, the front of your neck, the back of your neck. And now noticing any sensations in your face, in your cheeks. Noticing any tension in your tongue, relax that, or on the sides of your mouth, just letting that relax. Letting the muscles around your eyes relax, and your forehead relax. And now moving your attention into your skull. See if you can notice the whole of your head, any sensations there. And now just feel the whole of your body together. And see if you can sense a subtle delight or a subtle pleasure in the feeling of the body at rest and relaxed.
And just stay with that pleasure of relaxation for a minute or two. Just feeling your whole body at once and the three breathing through your body and the pleasantness of the body being at ease. If there are any parts of your body that are uncomfortable or painful, see if you can find the parts that are comfortable and have a sense of relaxation and just soak your awareness in them. And now just gently tune into the sense of receiving in simple, wholesome ways. Receiving the breath given to us by green growing things. Or receiving the sensations in our bodies. And just gently tuning in to a sense of thankfulness or gratitude or maybe related feelings of gladness or contentment or peacefulness or maybe even joy. If uh, during this meditation, the kind of more warm and heartfelt feelings are difficult to access, then just notice the peacefulness and the open receptivity. So just being aware of the earth, of the plants, of the animals. And can you find the thankfulness for these? An appreciation for the vast number of growing plants and living beings that have enabled your own living over the years. Can you be thankful for them?
the beauty of the stars at night and the moon, the light of the sun during the day. And now just be aware of people in your life today for whom you are thankful. So it's fine to be appreciative of some aspect of a person or aspect of a relationship, while also recognizing at the same time that there are other things about that relationship or that person that you may not be so glad about. But still focusing here on a simple sense of thankfulness for what you receive. What you've been given by various people in your life. Just staying out of entanglement, entanglements with them in your mind just now. Feeling grateful for the friendliness of others, for the love shown to you. Even in relationships that are complicated, even for, from people who are no longer in your life. Feeling grateful for the love you have received and other forms of support. Not denying the difficulties, but just staying focused on what is positive and supportive. Taking the experience of thankfulness and gratitude to be the object of your meditation. Just staying with the sense of gratitude and being increasingly absorbed in it. So your attention may move from one thing to another, lightly touching the many things you are thankful for. Or you might 
Find yourself resting in a primary sense of gratitude. Open-hearted, thankful, receptive, grateful, happy, just meditating in this. So in this thankfulness, there might be a softening, maybe an awareness of aspects of the life that you've had. And knowing that in the midst of the difficulties and the pain, that there can also be many blessings. And so there might be a general sense of gratitude, perhaps even some awe to the gift of life itself. So just notice what it's like to rest in thankfulness. It may be a sense of contentment. Just feeling contentment in the moment with a grateful heart. So I'll just stop talking for the next five minutes or so and just let you all stay quietly and meditate in whichever way you like to.
uh, may any peacefulness or happiness that we cultivated in our practice uh, be for the benefit of those whose lives we touch and for any departed dear ones for the radiant devas and ultimately for the welfare of all beings. So, as you may have all guessed, um, tonight's uh, small reflection is on gratitude. So, first of all, uh, what is gratitude? So, gratitude is the attitude of appreciation, basically, for something that we have received. And uh, the characteristics that gratitude bring us are like contentment, uh, an appreciation for what we have, for what we've got. And this uh, contentment that gratitude brings us is very nourishing and fulfilling for our heart. So when we receive something and we feel gratitude, uh, by being grateful, we also like really open ourselves up to the person or the things that were um, contributing in some way to us. So we're very receptive to their qualities and uh, the goodness that they have. So there's kind of a um, an aspect of mudita as well in gratitude. And when we feel, when so when we receive something and we feel gratitude, this um, creates a very positive state of mind for ourselves. And the Buddha said that there are two things in the world that are rare to find. And these two things are people who have a sense of serving others. And the other one is people who are grateful. And so with gratitude, it's important to express um, the appreciation that we have in our heart to others, because if we don't express our gratitude, then other people don't necessarily know how much appreciation and love we feel towards them. And also, of course, by reflecting on and expressing our gratitude, um, this strengthens these feelings in us. So it's almost sometimes like mm, we need to develop a a vocabulary, right, of thankfulness and gratitude and blessings. And, of course, that's one of the very nice things about being a monastic because we're always receiving things. Well, all of us are. It's just it's maybe more obvious for us. And uh, we have the practice of anamodana, which is a very lovely practice in our tradition where we kind of just really rejoice in the, the goodness and the generosity of the people who offer um offer to us and also it gives the people who offer a chance to really see their own goodness and generosity and bring them into their minds and uh, those see how those um, qualities really nourish them. And so, um, you know, gratitude's important for us to cultivate because the reality is that in life we are always receiving things. And also it's very easy to take um, what we receive for granted. We're constantly receiving gifts from the earth, from nature, from other people. Uh, we're constantly benefiting in many ways from our environment. And so it's good for us to um, reflect on these things often and really feel appreciation for them. So in the Buddhist tradition, there's a story of Sariputta. And uh, he was kind of elderly and he'd grown a lot through his time as a monk, but still um, every night he would sleep, orienting his head towards where Asaji was, just out of gratitude to Asaji for teaching him the Dhamma. And so even this very great monk kept in his heart that feeling of reverence and these feelings of thanks and of gratitude. And uh, there's also a story about the Buddha. Uh, this is a story I've heard, not one I've read, but uh, sometime after his enlightenment, uh, very early in the morning when the sun was in Ida. He would sit in meditation and just review in his mind what people had done for him previously. 
and he'd remember even a very small morsel of food that had been given to him. And when he remembered this, he would feel just so thankful about it. And in some cases, would try to find that person and see what they would need and see if he could give them back anything um, out of gratitude and out of appreciation. And there's another story about the Buddha that after his enlightenment, he not only remembered people, but also he remembered the tree that he was enlightened under. So he was very grateful to that tree and uh, very grateful to the law of nature and to the law of the Dhamma. And he thanked the tree for giving him shade from the sun and for protecting him from the rain or the wind. And how just being under that tree was so peaceful. So wherever we are, it's always good to remember that, you know, things don't come to us freely and people often have to sacrifice things in order for us to be happy and to fulfill our needs. Um, and people are generous to us. So it's good for us to remember that and feel gratitude for it. And uh, just to say as well that when we feel gratitude or appreciation for something, um, that doesn't need to be naive or deluded. Um, we can feel appreciation. And at the same time as feeling appreciation, we might also recognize uh, any mistreatment that might be there. So we can recognize the things that are problematic uh, while at the same time, at the same time, appreciating uh, what we've been given. So in an interview with um, Robert Emmons that I saw, he mentioned that these are like a spectrum of ways in which gratitude can be integrated into our lives. And he mentioned that gratitude can be like a practice or a way of life or a kind of fundamental orientation and a personality trait. And that, you know, at one level, we even teach our children to say thank you. And as a society, we see the basic expression of gratitude is important. And um, as Emmons notes, gratitude makes people happier. Um, it creates a sense of joy and purpose and also leads to other virtues such as compassion and generosity. Because grateful people tend to be more giving and forgiving. So gratitude has benefits for the individual and also for society as a whole. Because when we feel like full inside ourselves and our own cup runs over, then we're much more likely to be benevolent to others. And uh, Robert Emmons also notes that one of the ways that people create gratitude is through the construction of memories. Um, because it's easy to forget things and it's also easy to forget gratitude. Um, so not deliberately, it's just sometimes, you know, we think other people know how much they mean to us and we forget to appreciate them and to express that. So in the Buddhist tradition, the word that is translated as gratitude is katanyata, and that has two parts. So katang, which basically means something that has been done, and yuta, which is uh, related to the term for knowledge. So when they're put together, it basically implies uh, remembering what was done. So when we feel grateful, we remember what was done for us. Um, the Mangala Sutta says, a reverence and humility, contentment and gratitude, and timely hearing of the Dhamma are the highest blessings. Um, so I'm just going to read a bit from uh, Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi's commentary on this. Uh, gratitude literally means knowing the favours that have been done for one. The commentators speak about three levels of gratitude. One is simply appreciating the favours received from others remembering them and thinking about them with gratitude. The second is appreciating favors and then making an effort to repay the debt of gratitude that one owes others. And then the third is that one appreciates the favors and makes an effort to repay the debt of gratitude that one owes others. And then in one's mind, one honors the goodness of the person who has done the favor. And one constantly continues to feel thankful to that person with respect and appreciation. And uh, Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi uh, mentions his own teacher, the German monk, uh, Venerable Nyanaponika Tira, that um, in his old age, every day he would think back all the way to his youth and remember with gratitude the benefits that every significant person in his life had done for him throughout his whole life. 
And uh, Venerable Becky Bodhi continues to elaborate that when we cultivate this quality of gratitude, uh, we can think not only of those who have directly done favors to us, but can expand that sense of gratitude. So what he calls widening the circle of gratitude by thinking of all those who might be helping us in some indirect way on various levels. So um, in a monastery, we might recollect the people who do the shopping for us, who prepare the food for us, the people who bring the bottled water for us, or the people who help with the repairs in the monastery or help with the office work, or we could think of people who help repair the automobiles. Um, anyway, there's many, many aspects, obviously. Um, and so there's been a lot of research done on a practice called the Three Blessings Practice. Um, and for this practice, at some point during the day, often uh, just before sleep, people bring to mind three things that happened during the day that they are thankful for and why these things happened. And um, the practice can be enhanced by like actually writing it down and really marinating even just for a few minutes and those feelings of thankfulness or gratitude or happiness. And uh, when this practice is done each day and it only takes a few minutes, it has a far-reaching and very positive impact on people's lives. So there's been studies that show that even months later, if someone just did this practice for a few weeks, um, you know, the uh, depressed mood was greatly reduced or they would feel less anxious in general. Um, and this research, of course, reflects a major theme in the Buddhist teaching, which is just that the quality of our mental states really has a huge impact on our experience of life. And um, so gratitude um, obviously cultivates more positive relationships with others um, and improves our psychological health. And it helps us to track and feel appreciation for what we receive in life, for what we do have, instead of dwelling so much on what we don't have or what we lack. Um, and again, it's not about denying those things that we, we don't have and you know, trying to address them, but it's just not dwelling in them all the time, but at least, you know, kind of bringing up all those, also the positive aspects and feeling, you know, gratitude for them. Because as humans, we're not really hardwired to be grateful. And that's why it's it's a practice in a sense. It's much easier for us to grumble or complain or think about all the areas where we're experiencing pain or hardship. But um, focusing on what's going wrong in our lives tends to lead to negative mind states and also often creates a sense of powerlessness. So um, a commitment to living a life of gratitude takes some practice and some getting used to. But over time, we learn to tune more and more into what's good in, in our life and into the blessings all around us. And as our gratitude practice develops, we realize that we have a choice about how we respond to the challenges and hurdles that we face in life. And uh, over time, contentment can grow stronger than dissatisfaction and appreciation can become stronger than criticism or complaining and our resilience to life's challenges increases. So life becomes sweeter and we can become more happier and more content and kinder to those around us. And so um, pra practicing gratitude is in the way of whitewashing life to think our way out of painful experiences or to deny their existence, but just to direct our focus away from dwelling on what's not going well. While still acknowledging the existence of pain, we also cultivate an attitude of appreciation for the blessings that are there as well. And so like all positive emotions, gratitude feels good. And um, positive emotions are good for us in the sense that positive emotions lower blood pressure, protect the immune system against the impact of stress. And so in these ways, they preserve our long-term physical health. And they also um, help us bounce back from... From stress and trauma. So Barbara Fredrickson did research on those who had lost loved ones or been involved in the 9-11 attacks. 
And she found that those who had like a higher baseline of positive emotions before the attacks were able to recover better from the attacks and were also less likely to suffer from like depression and PTSD than those who had less positive emotions and mood as a baseline. And um, another aspect of Barbara Fredrickson's research was outlining what she called the broaden and build theory of positive emotions. So basically, when we have negative mind states, um, we tend to narrow our focus onto what's problematic, uh, what's wrong, and we can become very self-centered. But when we're experiencing positive emotions, um, even just mild emotions, such as feeling relaxed or experience a sense of ease or peacefulness or liking others or just being engaged in teamwork in a way that feels good, then when we have these positive mood states, this tends to broaden our view. So that means you tend to see the big picture and um, that leads to like more creative problem solving and a more flexible, open-minded decision-making process, which helps people more successfully deal with problems. And also, also over time become more creative, knowledgeable, socially integrated, healthy and resilient individuals. So there's obviously a spiraling up effect here. Um, so uh, we can reflect on what we're grateful for. I think uh, there are many things. So the food that we have to eat or even the gifts of peace and living in a civil society uh, for having shelter or for our teachers or the beauty of nature or so many things. And as practitioners, of course, I think we all feel very grateful for the blessings of the Dhamma and um, also to those who preserved the Dhamma from the time of the Buddha till now. Um, it's kind of amazing that these teachings have still stayed alive. Um, often people preserve them through many difficulties and hardships and uh, very challenging economic and social conditions. And uh, many people keep them alive by memorizing them and passing them down that way and also by writing them out. And then, of course, we have teachers who we have a chance to learn from today who like gave their lives to um, realizing these teachings and to sharing them with others. And then also, uh, you know, all of us who are lucky to be part of a community of practitioners, I think we feel very grateful for that. Um, our friends who dedicate them to the teachings, you know, inspire us in our own practice and help us keep our own dedication strong. So whenever we, we start reflecting on any aspect of our lives, then there are so many blessings sustaining us that we can think about. And also, of course, there's the great gift of life itself. So I'm just going to finish with a verse from the Samyusa Nikaya. Um, you should train yourself thus. We will be thankful and grateful. We will not overlook even the least favor done to us. Thus, you should train yourself. So thank you all for your attention and for coming tonight. And if anyone has any uh, questions or comments, it doesn't need to be on the topic of the talk, but just anything in general, then uh, welcome. If you raise your hand, I can unmute you. Let's check. Okay. So I don't know if any of you have ever done a deliberate practice of gratitude. So, of course, one reason I gave this talk was because I was feeling like the, you know, sadha side of my practice has been going down. So <laughs> gratitude's always a great thing to remember about and to practice. So I'll just share a story and then I'll come to whoever's raising their hand. But I remember some years ago, I was quite a few years ago now, 10 years ago, 
I was just like locked in these really negative loops, mind loops about, I don't know, issues at this monastery or was at. And, um, you know, you know, you kind of get into that problem solving state and you never manage to solve them. And I, I read about this, this practice of gratitude and I just decided just I would put them aside for a couple of days and really just focus on all of the good things about the situation. I mean, it was a challenging situation, but all the same, I did that. And it just really reframed my whole perception. And that really lasted for a whole a long time. So I was very, um, yeah, really surprised and shocked <laughs> that just taking an hour or so and doing that had such a profound difference. And then in the studies as well, like just, just taking two or three minutes a day and reflecting, like writing down just three things and why they went well. Like it really just has such far-reaching um, benefits in people's lives. So it's quite inspiring. But anyway, someone had their hand up. So yeah, I'm going to unmute Richard. Yeah. Uh, yes. Hi. Um, morning. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Um, I was sort of thinking about about gratitude and the eye. Um, the first my own experience with gratitude. Uh, um, my experience with my own parents wasn't very good, to be honest. You know, I'm growing up. So, you know, I haven't got very good experience growing up with my parents, to be very honest with you. So yeah. it took me an awful long time to actually appreciate even the fact that they actually were my parents, to be honest with you. But actually, you know, reflecting, you know, later on in my life, by practicing Buddha's teachings, you know, actually, I'm very grateful that at least, at least they gave me the human body, you know, so I'm very grateful that they gave me this life, that they actually gave me the opportunity to have a human body, you know, to actually be able to encounter the Buddha and his teachings. So I managed to develop that. And I've also fought a very good practice of actually practicing gratitude to them, you know, through, through different traditions, practice of giving back to them some, met, you know, some matter and, and uh, merit by every time I give my, every time I have my food, I, you know, I offer all the merit, a part of the merit, I offer the food to them, I offer, you know, the merit, you know, to my parents as gratitude for them giving me this life. You know, so I found it very helpful to my practice because, to be honest, it took me a very long time <laughs> to actually appreciate um, at least at least that they gave me the human body. You know, so that sense of gratitude, um, I'm very grateful at least for that. So from a distance, you know, I can say thank you. You know. Um, you know, you know, I mean, and obviously I've forgiven them as well now, you know, I appreciate their background and, you know, everybody's just the way that they were, I appreciate that. So I'm grateful that they actually gave me the human body that at least looked after me, you know, to a certain extent, you know, blah, 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 you know. And um, so, yeah, I'm grateful that they did take care of me, or tried to take care of me, at least physically, you know, to a certain point, if not um, emotionally or whatever. Um, so at least I'm grateful that they gave me a human body. So I practice every day when I, you know, dedicate my food. I found it very helpful for my state of mind to say thank you by dedicating my food, part of the merit to them. As in form of gratitude, because I think I heard that the Buddha actually said that you can actually dedicate your your merit of your food to your past um, seven last lifetimes of your last parents or something like that. I heard it somewhere, so mm. I think that as well. I don't know if that's true or not, but I find that very helpful, at least with my parents anyway, who are now both dead. So, you know, personally, I find that very helpful. So in sense of gratitude. So thank you. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you're welcome.
Yeah, and I really like how you, you know, have a daily practice. I think that's part of the secret, right? To have like a kind of rhythm of practicing gratitude and then to weave it into a, you know, some concrete acts or some concrete reflections each day. Otherwise the days just slip by and it's, at least for me, it's hard just to cultivate it, but actually reflecting then it shifts one's sense of things and yeah. Actually just, just thinking about gratitude, you know, my father actually recently passed and um, one practice that my teacher told me to do for him, which I'll share with you because I just found it enormously helpful was every day for the first seven weeks to, you know, send him Mesa for five minutes and just think of him with gratitude for everything that he had given me and um, also to share merits of anything I've done in the past and anything I've done in the future because I think it's true. We have very, very deep bonds with our with our parents especially, right? And so we can also benefit them, especially in the time just after they've passed. So I found that practice very helpful. And it means now even my, you know, my father, like a lot of fathers, he was somewhat complex. But whenever I think of him, I, I think of him with a lot of, you know, gratitude and meta. And I think it's partly because of that daily practice for the seven weeks after he passed kind of reprogrammed it and like you are with your parents you know our parents are often a mixture but you know we can really heal ourselves by really sending them that measure and that gratitude and like you're saying they do the best that they can right with the tools that they've got although it takes a long time to realize that I can't hear you by the way you're muted but yeah yeah it does help I uh, because like you know at least with my father, you know, he did try to apologise when I was about 16. But to be honest, the damage had been done too much psychologically. You know, he was he was like my, um, psychologically, he was like my Achilles heel. I just couldn't stand the guy, to be honest. And I was very grateful that I didn't grow up in America. Because, you know, that's all, that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> you know, because if I had a handgun, I probably would have shot both of them, quite frankly. So I'm very grateful I didn't do that because obviously that's one of a very heavy hindrance, you know. That, um, but you know, so I'm glad I didn't wasn't born in America, quite frankly, because I didn't hate them, but they were pretty. Um, um, it was pretty heavy, basically, for me. It took me an awful long time to deal with it, all, this, all that stuff. It took me about twenty years to sort it all out. I probably still got and still. Sometimes it still comes up even now. So I practice a lot of metta and I practice actually a lot of gratitude as well. So it actually has been quite good, actually, because it teaches me. Um, it's very beneficial with um, wisdom, actually. Beneficial with panya, beneficial with um, um, metta practice. In lots of ways, it's very skillful, actually, if anything. Now, now, you know. Um, because it makes you more compassionate to other people, you know, you, you know, because you can appreciate how other people feel, not just yourself, you know, because you can see the signs in other people. So, you know, I have um, a few friends, you know, who got bipolar, you know, a few friends who got problems, you know, and it seems quite weird that I have a few friends who are like that, and I seem to have the capacity to deal with them emotionally. I have the capacity to be open to them. You know, they can see that, you know, I'm, I'm not afraid of them. You know, they feel comfortable with me, you know, and they can talk to me. They can, you know, it's just quite nice, you know. So I find that quite good. And, um, you know, I think it's, it's very nice to, to be able to help people. So one of the practices I found very helpful myself it's actually, um, it's actually bodhicitta practice. It's a bodhicitta giving and taking, sort of mind mm. training from the Tibetan tradition. I find that extremely helpful because um, it's very easy to take it all me, 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 me. You know, I've got the problems or me, me, me. <laughs> and it's like, I find it very skillful to realize that um, in fact, it's not just me, 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 you know. Um, there's an awful lot of people out there with the same condition, 
So it's very, I find it very skillful, um, you know, using meditation and wisdom and um, compassion to actually, you know, um, practice that bodhicitta meditation sometimes. That's like, you know, one of the good arrows in the bow, you know, sometimes, you know, to sort of relate um, to other people in that way. And it actually just seems to help that it takes me out of myself that I'm not the only one who has this problem. And, it, yeah. you know, and in that tradition, they teach that actually it's a good form of purification for yourself, you know, and also it um, actually develops wisdom and compassion and kindness to other people. So it's sort of, it's very good. So through that as well, it's, it's been very beneficial. It's a form of like giving, you know, kindness. And so for myself, I find that very good as well. So that's all I wish to say anyway. So I guess, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. You're welcome. Shall I unmute Terry? Oh. Hi. My, sorry, my computer's playing up. I can't get the camera to work. Okay. I'm. I was interested in you looking at when you talked about uh, being thankful for living in a a civic society, um, with all that's going on in the world. It's really easy to be ungrateful, right? Um, We're not living in Gaza, right? <laughs> yes, right. Uh, so looking at and those and it personally affects me um, so I have to be mindful of including those that I disagree with mm. that I hatred is too strong I have no comprehension of their behaviour mm -hmm. and I find it really difficult to think of being Met, you know, loving kindness or gratitude to that group of people in my head. Well, I don't think you have to have great gratitude to them, right? I mean, gratitude's for people who benefit us. I mean, loving kindness is just wishing, not wishing anyone harm, right? And so you don't have to like someone to send them meta. Right. So there's a distinction there, like you might really disagree with them, but still have compassion for them and, and that you don't want them to suffer. If the, you know, their suffering doesn't necessarily make them better people, right? <laughs> so I think it's just teasing that out. Like you can still have discernment. You can still see really clearly what's not working. And I don't think you have to be grateful if people, have, you know, if there's no, I mean, if they're not bringing you any benefit. It's more like a lot of us are in mixed situations, right? Like, or traditions or situations where we're getting a lot of benefit, but there may also be harm. And so then we have to tease it out. But if it's a situation that's not bringing us much benefit yeah. and isn't connected to us, then it's probably gratitude might be the wrong target for gratitude, maybe, unless unless you're grateful to them for teaching you patience. That's what the Dalai Lama is <laughs> Right? His enemy the Chinese or whatever. <laughs> Thank you. So there's this thing in the chat. Yeah, I think it's true that, you know, we all find it really easy to focus on negative things. That's just how we're built as human beings, right? The negativity bias and all of that. You've probably all heard the science about that. It's just, you know, the mind is like, what is it, Rick Hansen's? The mind is like Teflon for the good things and Velcro for the bad things. And so that's our conditioning. Um, and so that's a lot of what spiritual practice is about, reversing it. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think actually just having some really concrete practices, like whether it's, I mean, before you eat, actually sitting for five minutes and really clearly thinking of things that you're grateful for and feeling it or sitting down and writing for a few minutes a day. Um, Robert Emmons has a whole lot of practices. He's got a few books on it, like, you know, writing gratitude letters, spending time really those who we're grateful for actually writing a letter and expressing it. There's a whole lot of categories he has and he recommends going through them. I mean, it doesn't really matter, but I think the main thing is just having really like concrete practices. And there's a, another really sweet practice that um, 
if any of you aren't uh, familiar with it, it's called Taking in the Good by uh, Rick Hansen. I'm quite, kind of a fan of his work in terms of he's quite good at teaching us how to cultivate positive mind states. And so his basic point is that, um, you know, like the bad stuff just goes straight in. We have, don't have to make any effort. We remember it. It clings to us. But the good stuff, actually, even how we're wired, we have to keep the good stuff going in our short-term memory circuits for about 30 seconds before it goes into our mind and gets hardwired. And so just a simple practice is if something good happens and you have a warm feeling, just stay with that for a few breaths and enjoy it. But if you're interested, it's called Taking in the Good by Rick Hansen. If you just Google that, it's a very simple practice. And you can just do it for 30 seconds at a time, a few times a day. And he sort of says over time that will switch the mind to becoming a lot more positive. So all these types of practices. Yeah. Okay. So someone has their hand up. Um, Regan. We talk. It's wonderful, lovely talk. Um, about gratitude. Um, about six years ago, now five, six years ago, I decided. Your volume is a little low. I don't know whether it is only for me or. Um, hold on a second. Let me just check. My audio should be fine. I checked it before I came on. Should be okay. Yeah, it says the volume's up and full. I think it's me. Just go ahead, Regan, and I'll just put my ear to that. I think yeah. it's me. I'll try moving in a bit closer. It's a new laptop, so I don't, yeah, I've not finished setting it up yet. Yeah, so about five or six years ago, I decided to uh, practice meditation on gratitude. And I didn't realize it at the time, but just how much it changed my life, everything. I had no idea that's what it would do. It's only um, reflecting on it now during your talk that I realized that's what happened. Uh, and I've gone from struggling to sit for 10 minutes, focusing on, on my breath to struggling to actually come out of meditation for focusing on how good everything was. Wow. Um, that's how much everything started to change for me. It had a domino effect on everything. Once I started realising all the good I'd already had in my life, I started to be able to add more good to it by changing things. I, I didn't even realise that's what I was doing at the time. Well, oh, that's very inspiring. And uh, actually, well, again, that's what the studies say. Like when we cultivate gratitude, you know, the mind becomes broader. It starts seeing more possibilities. So not so trapped by helplessness and all of that. And it sounds like that was your experience, even though you maybe didn't realize it, but that was what was happening. So it's very inspiring. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And so do you still practice that? Like when you sit, do you just um, do a meditation of what you're grateful for at first and get the good feelings flowing? Or I, I'm i quite fluid with my practice. Um, I'll go where I feel like my mind needs to go. Yeah. It yeah. will really tell you if you just listen. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. That's really wonderful. Thank you. Karen, I've unmuted you. Thank you. Hello, Venerable. Thank you so much. Um, my ears pricked up when when I heard the word you were talking about giving. I understood gratitude is also a form of giving. And then there was the word for giving. Can, can you say a bit about 
I think for giving is also a form of giving. But I find that very difficult to actually emotionally to connect with that. So to 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 get the um to feel motivated on a rational level, I know the value of forgiving, but to forgive to somebody, forgiving somebody, that that is a form of perhaps giving to them and to myself and to everybody. I wonder whether you, I don't know, whether you could sharpen that for me so that I can t take it in more emotionally. Mm -hmm. Um, so forgiveness is a big topic. Again, I, I think Rick does a really good job at kind of teasing out the different um, the different aspects of it. So one thing is when we forgive someone, I mean, to some degree we do it for ourselves, right? Like we just, because we may never, I mean, there's some people we need to forgive that we may never see again, but it's just letting go of the bad feelings in our heart. So that's part of it. And then, you know, these people... Um, so, so there's a type of forgiveness that is like the slate is wiped clear, right? And it's like nothing ever happened and you're completely open to them again. But um, there's also times that maybe people aren't, uh, that wouldn't be wise, yeah? And so you may forgive them in terms of letting go bad feeling in your heart and having meta for them. But again, that, that has to be really uh, connected with discernment. So, you know, there may be a person that actually it's not helpful for you to be interacting with much or a situation that would be harmful for you to be going in. And so, um, say, having a, um, you know, having clarity about that, that doesn't have to be having animosity towards them. It's just like, you know, if you go there, there's going to be some kind of harm to you. So you have compassion to yourself and you don't go. But that's different from, I guess, having real hatred or rancor towards them, if, if that makes sense. So Yeah, I think I think I think you've really just hit the nail on the head for me there. Um I think there is this um I forgive and I go back in. Yeah. I think that's that you get trapped in that toxic repetition again and again and um but it's actually it's okay not to go back in that that is not um uncharitable I think so I think that's something that's been really important for me as well to learn you know the difference between clear seeing and discernment yes. and having meta and the two are just separate <laughs> Yeah, and so I think really disentangling those is, is really helpful. That was really, again, I, I think I did a course with Rick and he was talking about, you know, really clear seeing, being really wise and being compassionate. Yes. It's, the two are different, yeah. So. Thank yeah. you. You're welcome. Because otherwise, I mean, I'll just say, you know, I think otherwise those bad feelings actually are kind of protecting us, yeah. Like if we don't, if we don't have clarity then we kind of need a version. <laughs> right. But if we have clarity and assertiveness and we really see clearly and we can, you know, put down boundaries or protect ourselves, then, you know, we can do that out of compassion for ourselves and others or wisdom. And we don't need those negative emotions to kind of, you know, form a barrier. So, yeah. Looking at the time, if anyone has a short comment, we have time for one more very short comment, and then I'm going to hand over to um, Minori or whoever the hosts are. Jali, would you take over then?
Thank you so much, Aya, for that wonderful meditation and those wonderful reflections. And, yeah, gratitude is such a blessing. I'm very grateful for gratitude. <laughs> um, but also, to I think, so you, you know, when you balance the, the sort of acknowledging the dark side and not sort of plastering it over, that was really so helpful. Thank you. Yeah, and I'll just say gratitude, you know, for the people I've read about that. They're all in the list, you know, but Rick Hansen and some other people like that are really good at making these distinctions. Yeah. So it's not like we should be grateful, right? No. And that, so the control mechanism, like, just be grateful for everything I've done for you and so then don't bring up anything uncomfortable. <laughs> but actually both can coexist and then I think it frees us up. So much appreciation for 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 not only that wonderful teaching that I adjet your generosity in supporting the Anukampa Bikuni project um, by coming along and giving us teaching, but also uh, giving that freely. Um, and it's just such a great blessing. And so I think you mentioned generosity, Aya, as a response to gratitude. And uh, also um, we wouldn't have the Anukampa um, Bikuni project without your generosity and the generosity of countless people. So Manoris just put the um, link in the chat. So if you can give your financial support, to the, the, the financial support is best at the moment while um, Venerable Chanders on, on retreat. Uh, we've now got this wonderful new um, Vihara um, and of course it costs to maintain so whatever you can give um, whether it's small or large um, if you can give a regular standing order that's really helpful but um, if you can't give because you've not got anything that's that's fine as well you can just give your presence and follow the teaching um, so thank you so much